Okay, so we're going to continue on looking at uh, magnetic fields. And what we're going to look at is a rule we can use to determine the direction that a positive charge can experience a magnetic force. So the rule is Fleming's left-hand rule. So what, to use the rule, you set out uh, your thumb and fingers in the, the way that is shown. So your first finger just pointing directly forward. Your middle finger should be pointing to the right of your first finger and your thumb should it be perpendicular to both of them. So each of the thumb and fingers represents something. And so we're going to try and line it up with a scenario. So your first finger points from north to south on an external magnetic field. Your middle finger points in the direction of conventional current or the direction that positive charges are moving. And your thumb indicates the direction that the magnetic force would act on the moving charge. Okay, so essentially we can apply this when the charges are moving perpendicular to the magnetic field. So that's the condition that allows us to apply Fleming's left hand rule. And if we want to know the direction of the force on a negative charge, it's in the opposite direction to a positive charge. So in this case, a positive charge experiences a force upwards, so a negative charge would experience a force downwards. It does exactly the opposite. Okay, so why does changing the direction of the current change the direction of the force? So we can explain it using the superposition of the field lines here. So on the left, what you can see is a current going into the page. So the X shows you the cross section of wire and the current is going into the page. And in this situation, we have a force downwards. On the right hand side, we can see a current coming out of the page. And you can see the, the region with the highest flux density switches from being above to below. And that's why the force changes direction. So that's how we can explain it in terms of the superposition of the field. We can also explain it using Fleming's left hand rule because what we're going to do here is we're keeping the field in pretty much the same direction in these two diagrams. The field is kind of towards the right and we can see what we're doing is we're changing the current from going out of the page to going into the page and you can see that the force completely changes direction according to Fleming's left hand rule. So it predicts exactly the same thing. Okay, so why does changing the direction of the external magnetic field change the direction of the force? So this time we'll use Fleming's left hand rule to explain it, but we could definitely do it using the superposition of fields too. So in these diagrams, the conventional current is the same in both. It's coming out of the page. So that's why your middle finger is pointing out of the page. So if you change the field from going up to down, you can see the force switches from being left to right and we can see we've changed the direction of the magnetic force. Okay so we've seen the effect that magnetic fields can have on a current carrying conductor but let's step back a second and look more generally about how magnetic fields affect moving charged particles. So a moving charge will always experience a magnetic force perpendicular to its velocity or another way of saying that is perpendicular to its direction of travel. So the force is always perpendicular to its direction of travel. And what that means is the magnetic force can only change the charge's direction of travel. It has no effect on the charge's speed. Or another way of phrasing that in terms of thinking about it with energy is the magnetic force does no work on the charge if the force and the distance it travels are always perpendicular. Okay, so in terms of how the force changes, if the charge is moving perpendicular to the magnetic field, that will maximize the magnetic force. If the charge is moving parallel to the magnetic field, you'll actually get no force acting on it. But in between the magnetic force would increase, but it's always perpendicular to the velocity. Okay, so if we actually send charged particles through a magnetic field, what we get is them moving in circles. So in this scenario, what we've done is we've applied the magnetic field into the plane of the page. So my first finger is pointing into the screen or the page. 
We show that the velocity of the charged particles is going up the page. So my middle finger is pointing upwards. So my thumb is pointing to the left. So we see that a positively charged particle will experience a force to the left and it will follow the red path that we can see there. It will travel at constant speed, but its direction will be changing, which makes it go in a circle. Now remember, a negative charge would experience a force in the opposite direction. So a negative charge would go in the blue path that you can see there. And we can actually change the radius of these circles by changing different properties. So if we make the uh, charged particle move faster, it will move in a bigger radius circle. If we make the magnetic field stronger, it would more move in a smaller radius circle. Uh, but we can explore that more once we get onto circular motion. Okay, so now we're gonna look at an application of combining electromagnets with external magnetic fields, and it's called an electric motor. Okay, so what we've got here is we've got an external magnetic field, which is with our north on our south pole, as you can see there. So what we're gonna do is we send a current through the wire going from A all the way around to D. So the first thing to look at is the side BC. So in this situation, the field lines are going from left to right, from north to south, for the external magnetic field. B to C is parallel to that, which means the charges moving through the wire are moving parallel to the field. So there'll be no force on the side BC at all. For side AB, the conventional current you can see is going from A to D. So they're gonna, the positive charges are moving from A to B. So then I'm gonna point my middle finger along the line from A to B. The field is going from north to south, so you can see that your thumb is pointing downwards for side A to B. For side C to D, the positive charges are going from C to D, so they're coming out of the page towards you. Field is still left to right, so you can see in that situation your thumb is pointing upwards. So C to D will experience a force pulling it upwards. And those two forces are going to be equal to each other, but as you can see, they're in opposite directions. And this is where we start to get the movement of our motor. Okay, so we've got forces acting on it, but our motor doesn't actually accelerate, at least not in a linear or a straight line type way. What happens is it actually rotates. So if we think about it as Newton would, these forces are equal and opposite. Therefore, the resultant force on the electric motor is clearly zero. They cancel each other out, and that's why it doesn't accelerate up or down that way. However, I've drawn in a dashed line that we call the axis of rotation, or the point at which it's actually rotating or spinning about. So those forces do not act through the axis of rotation. They are offset which means they are going to make it rotate. And we'll explore that more when we come on to look at moment. So what these two forces are going to do is they're going to make it rotate anti-clockwise about the axis of rotation. And that's why our motor spins. OK, so every electric motor has a device called a split ring commutator or commutator for short. And what that does is it reverses the current direction every 180 degrees of rotation. So what we're going to look at is why that is necessary. So what this diagram is showing you is what the motor would look like after it has rotated 180 degrees. So you can see that A, B and C and D have moved from where they were to start with, but current is still going from A to D. So if we use Fleming's left hand rule again, the field is still going from north to south, but from A to B, the current is going towards B, so it's going into the page. So you can see the force is downwards, whereas C to D, current is coming out of the page, so its force is upwards. So it's trying to rotate back to where it was before, which is not really much use. So we've got an electric motor which would rotate half, then go back, rotate half, and then go back. But by reversing the current, what that will do is that will swap those forces directions and it will keep rotating the same way. That's why the commutator is there to make sure it rotates only in one direction. So this is what an electric motor actually looks like uh, in a, like a small circuit type one. Uh, so th what it, the component looks like is on the left. If we actually look inside it, it looks like on the right. 
So we've got the stator, which is another word for the, the external stationary magnetic field. You can see we've got the rotor where the coils of wire are wrapped around and the brushes are our commutator. So what's gonna happen is that every 180 degrees, uh, we're gonna reverse the current direction using those brushes and the commutator there. Okay, so we've got the idea of how an electric motor works, but how can we increase the turning effect on our motor or essentially make it rotate faster or have a more powerful torque to make it rotate? Uh, there are the three main options here. We can, we're essentially, we're aiming to increase the magnetic force. So what we can do, we can increase the current, we can increase the external magnetic field strength, or we can wrap more coils and more turns around on the rotor part of our motor. All of those three things would give you a larger torque to make it rotate. And that concludes this video looking at the motor effect and Fleming's left hand rule.